Hello, everyone. As you know, if you watch the channel, we put out a uh, episode about, I guess it's a little over two weeks ago. I should have figured out what the date is. We actually put out that first video when the stock market was literally one day away from its all-time highs, saying that this coronavirus is going to be the pin that pops that overinflated bubble that is our world economy. And because the stock market was nearly at its all-time highs, we got a lot of pushback on that saying, why is this channel, which is supposed to be about loving life, sailing, exploring the world, very upbeat channel. Why are we all of a sudden being these Debbie Downers? We're doomsdayers, we're crazy, we're wearing tinfoil hats. And uh, yeah, didn't change my opinion of what we were saying. We were trying to warn all of you about maybe lightening up on your stocks if you're really, really, especially if you're on margin and you're, um, you know, expecting everything to just go along great for a while. Because if you're on margin, if the stock market goes down even a little bit, you're going to get margin called. And that's what we've seen with these crazy markets dropping record amounts uh, for days and days. And then eventually having that little, you know, bounce. Uh, they call that a dead cat bounce. Um, but I, my really, my thing isn't about stocks. I wanted to warn you to like lighten up. I didn't say sell everything because I wasn't even expecting things to get this bad this fast. Um, I was expecting the coronavirus to slowly make its way through the population. But the one thing somebody has said is that you can't, the human mind can't really understand exponential growth. It just doesn't make sense to us that one person gets sick and then four and then it's 24 and then it's 240 and it like goes on like that. Um, I just turned on this camera live. It wasn't planned, so I don't expect a lot of viewers. Most of you will probably watch this when it's recorded. Janice is not even here. She's in Toronto. She was visiting her son in Toronto because it was his birthday. Um, she'd already made those plans. And then if you've been watching the news, it's gone from nobody believes this is a problem to, oh my God, what the hell, this is a national emergency and flights are being canceled, borders are being closed. Even I didn't expect it to go this fast. I did expect it to eventually grow to where it would really slow down the economy. And in that first episode, I think the title was Recession or Depression. Um, at the time, I guess I was thinking probably recession. I mean, depression, it was a bit of a stretch even for me. I wasn't a Debbie Downer. I wasn't trying to be a doomsdayer, but I just thought the market was way overinflated. Um, now I'm starting to think there's just no way this doesn't turn into the mother of all recessions or more likely called a depression. Um, the reason I think that now is you, if you watch the news, I mean, people are finally taking this serious and even I wouldn't expect the NHL to stop all their games, the NBA, the baseball decided to put off the season until further notice. Uh, Disney World's closing all their parks, uh, Disney. And so, I mean, it's just one thing after another. Every time you turn on the news and where I work, I work at the Ottawa Police Strategic Operations Center. We have TVs that are constantly running CNN and CTV and all these news channels so that we can keep up to the moment by moment news. And even I'm like, every time I look at the thing, some corporation or some big thing has just decided, nope, we're not running business as usual. We're stopping all of our meetings. All the sporting events are canceled. Everything is just so. Let's all think about this for a second. What does that mean for the economy? Just think of, pick what, pick your one favorite professional sports team. In our case, we live in Ottawa. It's the Ottawa Senators probably would be the best example for us. If a game is canceled, that's bad enough. If a season is canceled, think about all the vendors, all the restaurants nearby, all the economy that comes out of just that one sports team that literally depend on that nightly or maybe every couple of day game, home game, where they, they that's where they make all their, their money. Without that, it would hurt. Now, let's just assume that was just the senators close. The rest of the economy is clicking along like normal. That would have a dent in the local economy. But this isn't just one sports team. This is multiple sports teams. This is concert venues. This is uh, big, you know, gatherings of any kind. Um, I've seen, I think it was, was it California governor that said that they're banning meetings of more than 50 people? Well, isn't that every church? And isn't that most big restaurants? So it's way worse than I even expected. Now, the reason I brought this live feed is I just wanted to let you know uh, to be prepared. If you just disregarded our other videos or thought this is supposed to be a sailing channel, why are you giving us financial stuff? Just do the one thing. Even if you don't do anything about your stocks or protecting yourself that way, go out and get prepared. Here's what's happening 
in my life in Ottawa. We are on the Ottawa police have been told that all patrol officers now have to carry their gas masks with them. Um, it's a little gray about when they're supposed to put them on, but I know if they're going into a hospital for any reason, they're going to wear their gas masks. Gas masks. If that's not going to freak out the population. Like, I mean, if you're just sitting there in the waiting room of the hospital and a bunch of police officers roll in with gas masks on, how is that going to make you feel? Are you going to feel more confident that the coronavirus is uh, just a, people are making too much of it, or are you now going to be freaking out? Um, I'm assuming if you go into anybody's house where there's a medical emergency, they're for some reason having trouble breathing, clearly the gas mask is going on. So then what happens when police officers start getting sick? Now you have to worry about all the platoon mates that they've been working with for the last week to 10 days. Um, it's it's going to get really, really bad. So factor in the economy is going to go to a grinding halt. Um, borders are going to get closed. World trade is going to go to a grinding halt. And then you have the fact that medical staff are going to be overwhelmed. Hospitals are going to be overwhelmed. In Ottawa, they have a testing center set up. But the very first day it was open, it was just so many people tried to show up to get tested. Because let's face it, you find out your coworker who has the cubicle next to you has it. And let's face it, there hasn't been a lot of testing going on. So the few people that have been tested positive are barely a drop in the bucket compared to how many people actually have it. And in case you aren't watching the best YouTube channel for getting like the latest details and a real broad understanding of the coronavirus issue is a channel called Peak Prosperity with Chris Mortensen. He does an almost daily update of the situation and he will, wow, if you go back and watch those videos, just go through them and you'll just learn so much. Some of the things I've learned is the uh, transmission rate of this virus is way higher than the normal flu. Uh, the normal flu, just for numbers, uh, is transmitted on average about 1.28 people for every one person that has it. So if I have it, I give it maybe to my wife. And on average, if we did it one person, eventually it becomes a little bit more than one. So 1.28 people get infected on average from each person that has it. The coronavirus is estimated and it's hard to know because a lot of the countries aren't giving us the real numbers. So they're kind of having to try and figure out what's the real number, what's the fake number. Let's face it, when you see how Italy has just been overwhelmed with it, Iran, they don't give us the real numbers, but let's face it, the number of people that are dying, the videos of mass graves, there's way more people in Iran have it than what they're officially saying. But there's a pretty high transmission rate for an entire country to get like brought to their knees. So the number is about 4, 4.7, I've heard, up to a, a 7, which means if I have it, I give it to, let's say best case scenario, four people. And those four people give it to four people. And those, whatever number of people by that point, I guess it's four times four, so 16 people, give it to four for each one of those people. It doesn't take very long for this to reach the population. And even some of the world uh, virus leaders have said that it's not unlikely that we're going to get 40 to 70% of the world population is going to get infected. So what does that mean? Does that mean that 40 or 70% of the people are going to die? Of course not. This virus doesn't kill everybody. Um, but anybody who's elderly, who has breathing problems, or if you have uh, severe asthma, or if you've been a pack a day smoker for your whole life, this is something that should really concern you. This is not going to be the normal flu. So keep that in mind. There's plenty of YouTube videos of people that have survived it, who've talked about how horrendously bad this was. People who've said, I've had dozens of flus in my life, and they've all been fine. This one knocked me to my knees you know, the cold sweats, the fevers, the aches and pains. It's not It's not fun, even if you survive it. And it'll take you weeks to be considered over it because from what, a few numbers that I'll just throw out to you. The reason this virus is so hard to detect is because most people who catch it don't show symptoms right away. So you get it from your spouse. Let's say we back it up. You find out your spouse has it because she's now got symptoms and you might go 10 days before you have symptoms. Those 10 days, you might've been walking around, going to work, talking to people, not even aware you have it. And then you give it to those people, those four people on average. And then they give it to four people before they know they have it. And it just goes on and on and on. Um, so the reason I wanted to do this is just go out and get prepared, get food, get water, get things that if they told you you're quarantined, you're gonna be here for a month in your house, you have enough stuff to keep you occupied, uh, you're going to be reading books, watching TV, doing whatever you got to do because you got to be stuck in your house the whole time. So have enough food, canned food, dry food, rice, things that 
because if everybody's in the same boat, you can't just call up your neighbor and say, hey, can you go down to the grocery store and get me some food? A, the grocery stores might be empty. B, your neighbor might be like, no, I'm quarantined too, man. I can't leave. So then you start to running out of people that are actually not quarantined that can actually go out and get you more food. Um, Janice just called me from Toronto and told me that she got called by her boss. She works for the federal government. Um, and they were told that all employees are to be work from home for three weeks. And that's just as of now. So if the, I don't know if this is every government agency or just the agency she's in, but three weeks. And I said to her, can you work from home? And she's like, no, because last time we worked from home on some ice storm or something, they sent us home for a day or so. And they said, work from home. When everybody got home and felt guilty that they need to work, they all tried to get onto the VPN if they were smart enough to have brought their laptop home. They all tried to get onto the VPN to contact you know, the mainframe, the government mainframe, and it overloaded the system. And they had to send out text messages and emails saying, please get off the system. It's overloaded. The people who really need to be on there can't get on. So clearly, telling the government employees to stay home and work from home means just stay home and don't do anything. So again, back to productivity is your economy. If everybody's told to stay home, Who's doing anything? Who's producing anything? Who's going to the store and buying anything? Nobody's going to the movie theater, guaranteed. You know, nobody's going on vacations. Three of my coworkers had vacations because it's a March break here in Canada or in Ontario. Um, so a lot of people who have kids have already planned cruises and going to Cuba and doing all these other things. All of those people had their vacations canceled because either the airline's not going to fly there anymore or the resort's just not accepting people anymore. They all got their money back. That's a good thing is at least all these resort people and uh, flight people getting their, they're on board with, okay, it's not your fault. You're not canceling because you just didn't feel it coming. Um, so they're all got their money back, which is good, but just goes to show you, this is global. Um, so it is what it is. Get prepared, uh, have enough food, water, and things to do at home, pick up a hobby or do whatever you got to do download as many of your, like get your Netflix subscription paid or whatever you're going to do and uh, get ready to ride it out. Um, again, financially is going to affect all of us. I'm not happy about it either. If you saw the first video, I said, I'm really backing up the truck with gold, silver and gold stocks. Well, gold and silver, silver's held up. Okay. The gold stocks got absolutely lambasted. I mean, I've lost a ton of money because the gold companies got pounded every time the stock market went down, so did the gold companies, even if the gold barely moved. And unbeknownst to me, at 2008, they were like, now everybody's admitting, oh yeah, back in 2008, same thing happened. When there's panic in the streets and when people are getting margin calls, what ends up happening is people or, or the brokerage just sells everything you own. If you're getting a margin call, they just literally liquidate your account or liquidate randomly your stocks. So the gold companies got killed as well. Now, what I've heard, that same thing happened in 2008 during the the, the, the sharp drop. Um, but once things sort of like plateau and things are bad, but sort of bouncing around the bottom for a while, um, the gold stocks will recover because let's face it, gold is still valuable and their number one cost is fuel, diesel fuel to run those big massive trucks and bulldozers and stuff. That's their biggest cost. And if you haven't been watching the financial markets, Oil went from like $65 a barrel down to like $32 a barrel. So in other words, these gold companies, their cost, their biggest cost just got cut in half. So these gold companies will be very profitable going forward. So I'm sticking with my gold stocks. I've also doubled down on my coins. I bought uh, more, this time gold. I told you before I had a lot of silver coins. I've or ordered gold coins. I just want to have my money instead of cash. I want to have it in something a little more substantial in case there's a little bit of a lack of faith in the fiat currencies. So that is what that. Now, I see a lot of comments down the side. I'm sorry, all of you guys. I haven't even been reading them. I didn't expect a lot of comments because what I plan to do is when Janice is back Sunday night, we plan to do a live episode where we will be prepared with Janice here reading the comments like she usually does um, to answer your questions. Uh, so it could be a little bit more of a back and forth. Um, when I'm doing this, looking at the camera, it's a little hard to go and read these messages scrolling by. So be be expecting that you're going to see a thing come out saying Monday night or Tuesday night, um, we're going to be doing a, a live episode. It could be during the middle of the day because clearly she's going to be at home because she's not going to work. 
Uh, I'm off Monday, Tuesday, the way my platoon schedule works. I'm actually off Monday, Tuesday. So I guess we could do one in the middle of the day, but I assume most of you work and uh, would rather have a live episode in the evening. So write in the comments if you uh, are looking forward to that and if you prefer it in the evening or if you prefer it in the middle of the day or if you just don't care as long as you get to see it. Um, most people who don't see it live will see it as a recording after the fact. So there you go. Like I say, coming right from a police officer's perspective, I don't wanna freak you out, but I'd feel really bad if I didn't warn you to be prepared to be quarantined in your house against your will even for a month. Just, I would even get two months worth of food just to be really, really safe. Um, if your spouse gets it, even if you don't get it, or for some reason you're immune to it, um, just to be safe, you're going to be quarantined with your spouse. So you've been sleeping beside them every night in bed and they get it. There's no way that they're going to trust that you don't have it. They're going to say, stay home. Do not come to work under any circumstances. So, uh, yeah, all those hourly workers who work in restaurants, you know, McDonald's, Tim Hortons, just wherever, um, it's going to be really rough because big corporations can afford to say, stay home, we'll pay you anyway. But the ma and pa business that's literally barely making ends meet as it is now, if this is going on and they're running a small uh, restaurant, for argument's sake, they're going to say, sorry, restaurant's closed, go home. And they're clearly not going to be able to afford to pay people for weeks and weeks to just not come to work. So, uh, yeah, I'm assuming the government, they've already dropped interest rates. They've promised million, well, in the American case, trillions of dollars. Um, overnight, the repo market, the, the Federal Reserve has pumped, oh, the other day, a couple of days ago, I know overnight they did $1.5 trillion they pumped into the repo market, which just... I don't want to try and explain the repo market, but just say they pumped $1.5 trillion into printing more money to help the economy. Tuesday, I believe, the Federal Reserve in the States is having another meeting, which I almost guarantee you, you can bank on this, they're going to cut the rates again, at least 50 basis points. So yeah, if that helps the economy at all, I, I mean, I don't think when your economy has gone to a grinding halt because so many people are being told to stay home that lowering the interest rates is going to make one bit of difference, but they want to feel like they're doing something. But here's what I'm concerned with. Interest rates are so low. I think they're at like 1%. The Federal Reserve rates about 1% in the States. So if they cut 50 or 75 this next meeting on Tuesday, they're almost out of bullets. They're almost out of injections to give the economy to bolster it because yeah, they can go below zero like Germany does and some other countries actually have a negative interest rate, which doesn't even make sense to me. But um, yeah, I mean, maybe they can go one quarter percent negative interest rate or half of how far can they really go is what I'm getting at. So once they start saying, hey, it's not so bad. And by the way, we made things easier by lowering the interest rate. They get to a point where they don't have that as an option anymore. Um, and then it's going to be helicopter money. It's going to be, hey, if you're making less than $60,000 a year as a person, we're going to give you, we're going to send you a check for $5,000 just to help you make ends meet, to make it feel like they're helping you. But the point is, where's that money coming from? All these governments are already running massive deficits. Um, so if they all just print more money and, and give it to everybody, just like helicopter money, drop it from the sky, it's just adding to the, to the deficit, which is really the taxpayers paying for it. So, and again, that will take away the uh, eventual confidence that this fiat currency, this paper currency is worth anything. If you're going to just print it and give it away, then is it worth anything at all? Or is it just paper? So that's why I've got the gold and the silver and all that stuff because it's real. So anyways, that's it. Expect a live episode. I'll take two minutes to just go through these comments. Thanks everybody. I, like, again, this wasn't a planned thing. This was a spur of the moment thing. Um, it's too late for that here. The Canadian economy is already in decline. Yep. Good call. It was a great meeting you in Annapolis. Thank you. Um, do, do, do. yeah, get on your sailboat and you're fine. If I could, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you got to eat, right? You got to go to shore and you got to provision your boat. But yeah, if I was worried about catching it and Janice and I were at the stage where we had the catamaran and we could go offshore, you know, you know, I've actually said this before. I've said, you know, one day when we live on a sailboat full time, if there's a zombie apocalypse, we all joke about it man, we just get away from shore and let the zombie apocalypse burn itself out and we'll be fine. This isn't a zombie apocalypse, but I mean, if you're worried about getting it, if you had a breathing problem and you really wanted to be sure you're not going to get it and you had a boat like a catamaran or even a monohull that's a liveaboard type monohull, 
and you had enough provisions on board, just go, go and take a month and just go to some, um, you know, some abandoned island somewhere and just anchor next to it and hang out until this is all blown over. But um, yeah. Uh, love your review, your channel and your reviews. Thank you. I, again, this is not meant to be a financial, oh my God, uh, sell your stocks, buy gold channel, but obviously I'm in Canada where it's winter time. We're not sailing right now. And this stuff seemed very, very important to say. Um, and again, as a police officer, I see it, uh, the front lines of it, and it's going to be uh, eye popping what's going to happen in the near future. The, the number of people that have actually been diagnosed as having it is such a small number compared to the population of the US or Canada. But that's mostly due to the fact that people aren't tested. So many stories, dozens of stories of people who felt terrible called the health line. I feel like crap. I have a fever. I have all the things. What should I do? And they said, we don't have any testing kits. Just stay home or whatever. So those people weren't getting captured. I've also heard stories of people who have died uh, who were un up to that point quite healthy and maybe elderly, but healthy, you know, active, healthy, older person over above 60. And all of a sudden they get a flu, they get the pneumonia and they die. And it was written off as natural causes, which I mean, so that, that, that person didn't even count in the statistics of people who had the coronavirus and died. So it seems like only people who have been sick enough to get tested and then they eventually die, get counted. All the other people just natural causes, right? So, um, and if you think Canada and the US are fudging the numbers, do you think China is not fudging the numbers like tenfold more or Iran that's we know is really infected? Do you think you're tell they're telling you the real numbers? No. So the numbers of people that are officially are a drop in the bucket compared to what's really out there. Um, doo -doo -doo. Drink water every 15 minutes. Somebody said their doctor in China said drink water. I don't know. I don't think drinking water is going to make a difference. I mean, it can't hurt to be hydrated, but if you're going to get a fever, you want to be hydrated, right? But I don't think it's going to stop the coronavirus from getting you. Uh, it watches the germ, germs down the throat. Okay. Wives tale. No. Um, uh, yes. It takes 14 days before symptoms rise up. Yes. Um, who's saying that? Uh, Roland Walker. Yeah, I've heard 10 to 14 days, and I've even heard the other scary thing, contagious that whole time. And then you get sick, and then it might take a week or 10 days or whatever amount of time for you to get over. The, the, the stages are a cough, like a cold. Um, it just feels like a normal cold. One guy I was watching on YouTube who went through it in China, he's in Wuhan province, he's a reporter, I guess, and they interviewed him, and he said, I had a cold, and this is before the Chinese were letting everyone know about it. He got it early. Um, it was a cold, uh, nasal congestion, cough, um, just thought he had a normal cold, didn't think anything of it. Then he got, he said, it seems like you always get better and then you get worse and then you get better and then you get worse. So cold seemed to be tapering off. He thought he was getting better and then he got the flu. Uh, you know, the fever, the sh you know cold chills, the sweating, all that. He says the worst flu he'd ever had. He'd had, he said, I've had the flu at least six times in my life. I kind of knew what to expect. Still didn't know it was um, the coronavirus thing at this point. Um, but then it got so bad, his fever got so high, he got hospitalized. And that's when they tested him and found out he had the uh, coronavirus. Uh, he said, then he was felt like the flu, you know, he's getting medical help and all this stuff, uh, you know, the IIV and everything he needs to stay hydrated. And, and then he felt like the flu was going away and then he got pneumonia. And, uh, by this point he had been sent home. He was quarantined in his apartment and he said the pneumonia, he explained it this way. I had, um, the swine flu when it went around and I had pneumonia as well. And I'm telling you that it's horrible because you literally can't breathe. You're always gasping for air. He explained it as picture your lungs only have 20% of their capacity. So even getting off the couch to go answer the phone, you feel lightheaded, you're winded, you're like got to sit back down. I mean, it's, it's nasty. Plus you got the fever and all the other stuff. So this is not a joke. I mean, even if you're healthy, this is going to be some nasty nastiness that you're never going to forget. If you're not primo in shape with great lung capacity, this can kill you. Because if you're just out of breath, if you're a healthy person and you're just out of breath because you had to get up to answer the phone, picture somebody who already has terrible lung capacity. They may just collapse and faint and lay there on the floor and nobody may even know they're there if they're quarantined by themselves. It's just nastiness. So um, I don't wish this on anybody. Um, do, 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 do. What about elderly neighbors? Yeah, elderly people are not that they're, I don't think they're more likely to catch it. I think that they're more likely to die from it. 
um, just because, again, uh, they don't have the greatest cardiovascular uh, and lung capacity that they did when they were in their 20s or 30s. But I've seen um, pie or bell charts of the people that have it and their age group, and it's literally from like teens, 20s, all the way through. It's just that the people who succumb to it are the upper end of that thing. But don't think that, you know, well, I'm 25, so I'm not going to catch it because I'm healthy. It doesn't work like that. You get it. But it's just you can live through it. Um, hey, Uncle Muir. Uh, do, 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 do. Do, why don't you give a couple of weeks before you start all this doom and gloom? Oh, my God. Watch the news. Um, I'm not telling you something. I'm not making this up. Watch the news. Look at the footage from Italy. I mean, it's a Western country, more likely to be telling closer to the real numbers than, let's say, China. But um, they closed down the whole country. Uh, it's bad. So if the, if the United States and or Canada or the rest of the world starts closing down entire states, um, yeah, this is going to be like an economical collapse like you have never seen. This is not... 2008, where it was a housing bubble, where the banks were on the hook for a bunch of terrible loans and some of the banks might collapse. But you, who didn't even have anything to do with the banking industry, still go to work, still being productive, still doing your job. That was still a bad recession. What do you think is going to happen when entire industries literally stop going to work? This is not going to be a joke. So anybody who's still going, oh, you're overreacting, uh, come on. I mean, when I first did this episode back at the beginning, I could see why some people were laughing and saying, you know, take off the tinfoil hat, but I shouldn't have to explain this to you now. So please watch the news. Go watch any news channel you want. CNN, Fox, NBC, CBS. If you're Canadian, CTV, it, it's bad. And when entire states in the United States are saying we're banning people from being anywhere near anyone out. You can't be anywhere where there's 50 people in the same place. That's pretty serious. They don't do that. That's going to ruin their economy. You don't do that unless you're really, really, really sure that shit is going bad. So keep that in mind. Um, I'm praying for the... <laughs> yeah, I'm praying we don't have the quarantine voluntary home for a month. That's what I say. Bring... Make sure you got a lot of books at home or you have a lot of movies on your laptop or you've got the Netflix account or whatever you got to do. Or if you got an inventory of Blu-rays and DVDs, which I have on the wall over there. Um, yeah, somebody said they just got off a cruise ship and there was no issues. Yeah, not saying every cruise ship's going to have it. I think the cruise ships that are getting off now, you're going to find they're not taking on new passengers. Um, or soon that'll happen. Because all it takes is one passenger gets on who didn't have symptoms when they got on and then starts feeling like shit when they're on the boat. And the the shipboard doctor goes, yep, they got it. And the whole boat's getting quarantined. So, yeah. And what about all those employees who go one week after another after another dealing with thousands of passengers? You don't think some of those employees are getting sick and not being aware of it until the next batch of passengers comes on? Anyways, last place in the world I'd want to be. The last is cruise ship followed by airplane. Because cruise ships stuck in the ocean won't be allowed to go to shore if you're if anybody on the boat has it plane, you're sitting with 200 people in a very, very tight place, sitting shoulder to shoulder, re breathing recycled air that's just being, I mean, people are like, oh, the stuff that comes out of the vent at the top has been filtered. Yeah, but everything you exhale is going into the filter and coming back out. You're just breathing all over everybody else who's sitting near you. So <laughs> come on. I love how some people come up with like, no, no, it's filtered. It, your, your planes are fine. No, no. Um, flu killed over the flu. Yeah. Okay. So the flu kills in the States. We'll use the States number. People are like, oh, the flu kills more people. Oh, so I'm so tired of hearing that. I don't know if anybody else is tired of hearing that. Here is the issue. The flu has been around forever and we've never been able to eradicate it. I think like 25 million or 30 million Americans get the flu every year and only 17 to 37, depending on the year, thousand people die. 17 to 37,000 people out of who knows how many countless millions of people get it. Some people get it and don't report it or don't even go to the doctor. They just live through it alone. So those don't get counted in the statistics. But it's a very small percentage of people that actually die from the flu. Very small. Even elderly people seem to be able to weather it in most cases. Um, this is not the same thing. Uh, the reason people haven't started dying, well, I mean, we're already, I think, in the States. Last I saw today when I was at the work, of course, those TV screens are on the whole time. Um, I think it was 23, no, that's Canada's number, 20, 
300 confirmed cases in Canada. I can't remember what the American number is. That's not very much yet, but that's because they just started testing people. Um, a lot of people have been sick for a week or two weeks and they're like, oh, I think I have it. But every time I call, nobody has the testing kit for me. So anyways, and in the meantime, they've probably gotten their spouse sick and their kids sick and everybody else is going to be sick. It just hasn't come out yet. Like that one person wrote to confirm what I was saying. 14 days is about the average incubation period where people are just going around not knowing anything. So uh, anyways, um, how do I feel about the RCMP or Quebec police not checking the, the migrants coming across the border from all over the world into Quebec? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't want to get too political, but let's just say the Canadian society is very welcoming of new immigrants and the prime minister that's in power now is very pro-immigration. So the last thing he wants to do until it's clearly obvious is start banning everybody from coming into Canada. And I think it's going to be to our demise, but what, what are you going to do, right? It's already in our society. It just hasn't been captured yet. So even if we close the borders today, it's not going to change the fact that the people who already have it in Canada have been circulating and giving it to everybody else anyway. And that exponential growth, that one turns to four, turns to 16, turns to 200, turns to 3,000, that's going to happen whether we close the border now or not. So let's just use that number. Uh, somebody, some doctor who's a, a virus spe a specialist said, the way it's going to grow is it's going to get 40 to 70% of the population. I'm guessing that other 30% are either just immune to it or live in the middle of nowhere by themselves and therefore have no exposure to anybody who could get uh, contaminated. But let's say 40 to 70% of the population gets it. And the death rate is very all over the map. If you look at Iran or uh, Iran has seems, their, their numbers seem crazy. And that's why we know they have probably millions if, if not hundreds of thousands of people infected because it seems like anybody who visited Iran or visited um, uh, Italy flew back to the country and then we're sick. It seems like so many people were there for like a weekend or a week and come home, boop, sick. So, I mean, it was all over there. Uh, everybody, there was a lot of viruses being spread around those countries. You could, the number of people getting, catching it from those countries is just way too high. Um, but if you look at, here's the number I always tell people, don't look at how many people have died compared to how many people have it. Because those people who have it haven't gone all the way through the cycles to where they might die. Um, go with how many people have died there's a on, on that peak prosperity thing. He puts up charts. How many people have died compared to how many people that country says have recovered from it? That's what you want to know. How many people died versus how many people recovered? That means somebody's gone through the flu, gone through the pneumonia and survived it. So if you divide the number of people who have died by the number of people who have recovered it, it's a scary high number, scary high. So I, I don't even want to try and guess at what the death rate is. It's much higher for people that are elderly than young. Uh, in fact, young children, for some reason, like really young children, let's say under nine or something, they seem to be, it's like for them, it's like catching a cold. They seem to just get it, gets a little bit sick and they get over it. But the problem is they can spread it to everybody else that has contact with them. So they are little carriers. Ah. Uh, yeah, somebody's saying, I think I got over the coronavirus. It's quite likely if you didn't get tested. Uh, I personally, getting over the coronavirus, had a fever of 101 for five days with a max temp of 104.5. Woo! I've had 104 fever in the past when I was a younger, younger, I think, child. And I my mom took me to the hospital. I was hallucinating at 104 or five. I mean, you literally, your brain is frying. And uh, I remember having being awake and seeing people but then people's faces would morph and scary things would come at me. And I maybe maybe it's because I was a kid, but I remember like being freaked out by the doctor leaning over to look at me because I, his face wasn't a doctor's face. It was all like monster like. So, yeah, I don't I mean, as an adult, maybe your logical brain works a little bit better. So maybe you don't have that. But 104.5 is high. And now getting over the chest infection. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you have it. Um, the fact is normal flus don't come with high fevers. So if you think, oh, I don't know, maybe it was just the flu. I don't think, that, well, anyways, you get my point. If it, you, if it was like the worst thing you've ever gone through and you had the high fever and everything else, chances are you had the coronavirus. The only reason you didn't know you had it was because there was no ability to test you. Um, and like I said, now that they're testing, the numbers are going to shoot up how many people have it because people are freaking out and they're going to these test facilities and staying there until they get tested. They're demanding it. And of course, the government is now saying, oh, okay, we better test these people. Um 
the QCH in Ottawa now that goes to, uh, oh yeah, I see what you're saying. So this person works at the Queensway Carlton Hospital in Ottawa. Uh, the place is a ghost town. I've never seen the emergency room so empty. It's pretty eerie. You know what that is? It's people now have realized, well, A, the health people have been broadcasting, do not go into the emergency room if you're sick, please. Cause you're just gonna get everybody who's there for a broken leg sick as well. Um, stay in your car, we'll come out and test you out there. Do not come in the hospital. So that's part of the reason. The other thing is, let's face it, there's a, Canada has free healthcare. So let's face it, as Canadians, we tend to go to the hospital for a lot of stuff that an American who knows they're gonna get a bill for like 20 grand will not go for. A lot of people in the States who don't have great health plans where it's gonna be free for them, will not go to the hospital. I, I heard a story of a lady who got her leg crushed on a subway platform in the United States. I mean, people were there with their cell phones. So I guess this all got captured. Um, this lady's leg got literally snapped and she's laying on the platform and somebody says, I'm calling the ambulance. And she said, no, don't. Just help me call my husband and have, he'll come get me. And they're like, what are you talking about? Your leg is clearly broken. And she said, I can't afford to have the hospital bills that will come with this. So I don't know what she was planning to do, get her husband to come with a splint, I don't know. But that's what I mean. If, if you are worried about the cost in the States, you're not gonna go to the hospital for the little things. Canada, other way around, everything's free. Like, oh, I've got a sprained ankle from playing sports, I'm gonna go to the hospital. Um, so nobody in their right mind is gonna go to the hospital with something that isn't earth shatteringly important. And uh, that's where there might be deaths that aren't assigned to coronavirus that are because of coronavirus. You go in there because you had a heart attack and while you're in there, you're getting all this virus blown in your face. And then you get pneumonia while you're getting over your heart attack and you die and they blame it on the heart attack. So yeah, anyways, all to say the numbers we're getting aren't exactly accurate. So, <laughs> okay. The flu didn't exist before we had electricity. Oh, okay. Um, don't know what electricity has to do with it. Um, the Spanish flu of 1918, I don't think, well, I guess there was electricity, but it wasn't a, we're not, we weren't all in front of computer screens and stuff. Like I could see now if I, we were all getting cancer, people might say, oh, it's only because of we're so bombarded with electricity. I might almost believe you on that one. But um, the biggest flu pandemic that killed the most people up till now was the Spanish flu of 1918. And 1918, it wasn't a super advanced society. People weren't sitting in front of computer screens and TVs all day. Um, doo -doo -doo. Maybe that was a joke. I don't know. If you were not if you were joking, go ha ha next time. Um, they're, they are asking people to come to doctor's offices if you're sick, no mask, no nothing. Now nah, that's changing now. I know my wife's personal doctor, she had to go in for a totally unrelated matter. She had an appointment and they asked her on the phone, are you, do you have any flu symptoms? Do you have any cold symptoms? If you do, don't come in. And on the, when she got to the door to open the door, there's a big sign. If you have a cold or flu, do not come in. So and most family doctors now are on board with the, if you feel even the slightest bit sick, don't come in. And I'm thinking, well, what happens if you're going in there to get a prescription because you have a really deep chest cold like people would get in the past? And they're like, I guess they're just going to email it to you. They're just going to trust you from talking to you on the phone and go, we're emailing you the prescription. Go to the pharmacy and go get your, your thing. We just trust that if you say you have chest cold, you have a chest cold. Um, they don't want to infect their staff and other people in the waiting room. So I, and I don't, I don't blame them. Being a doctor or a nurse must suck so much right now because people are coming to you because they're sick. And then you're in right in your face trying to you know, look down their throat. And I'm like, I mean, come on, you're, if you aren't one of those few people that are like somehow immune to this, um, you're going to get it. So, um, Corona deaths will go up before they go down. Oh yeah, for sure. They're going way up. I mean, I don't know how many deaths are going to be at the end of all this. Maybe a year from now, the finally the deaths will tail off to almost not even worth mentioning. And by then we'll see what the total amount is for the whole world. It's going to be a big number, big. But keep in mind, it won't be as big as the reality because many, many, many countries are under representing how many people have died from coronavirus when it really was coronavirus. Um, Oh, nice to hear you speaking. Uh, anyways, we're going on a bit here. So what I want to do is say, we'll do this properly. Maybe Tuesday, Janice will be here. Um, maybe I'll come up with a little bit more of a structure and what we want to talk about. So anyways, look forward to that. I appreciate uh, those that just randomly popped in because this wasn't planned. And I just want to make sure that everybody is not, <laughs> not pretending that this is nothing still. Please, for the love of God, still go to the grocery stores while there's still some canned food on the shelves and make sure that your family has the ability to shut yourself in 
for, I'd say, two months. Be, because, like I say, the first person who gets sick will start your clock for when you're quarantined, but the last person who's still sick will keep the clock going. So go for two months worth of food. Um, yeah. Don't, don't depend on friends and family bringing you food because they may also be quarantined. Okay? So hopefully everybody as many people as possible, stay healthy. Hopefully I stay healthy and Jenna stays healthy. We will definitely probably do another episode that live one on Tuesday. And then I'm sure this is going to get much worse before it gets better. So we'll probably do another episode. Spring is coming. So sailing season's back. I think we're loading our boat in the beginning of May, but we're starting to worry whether there's even going to be a launch in May. If things are that bad that people are told, just stay in your house. Don't go around other people, yada, yada, yada. I mean, are we even going to have a boat launch? Um, anyway, we'll see. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Thank you for watching, and I'm going to cut it short so it's not too long of a video. Ciao for now.